Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down 100 Bullets Volume 11. In this volume, we're going to see the various factions of the Minutemen square off against each other. There's going to be Graves' team, Wily's team, and Lano's team, and they're all going to merge and have themselves a messy situation. Then we're going to have a three-issue arc called Tarantula, where we will learn the origin of Mr. Shepard, and we will also have Ronnie Rome going to Italy to confront Echo Memoria and try to get that stupid painting that they're always trying to get. <laughs> so let's dive into it. 100 Bullets, Volume 11. 100 Bullets, Volume 11, Once Upon a Crime, written by Brian Azzarello, art by Eduardo Riso. Because there are so many goddamn characters in this book, before we dive into this volume, let's take another look at the character breakdown and see who's dead and who is allied with who. So the red X's signify everyone that's dead. I've also put the issue number they were killed in, so Daniel Perez got killed in issue 25. And the most recent major character, Axel Nagel, he got killed in issue 69. Among the Minutemen, for now it seems like everyone has finally picked a side. Remy Rome has joined Agent Graves and Cole Burns, and Jack Daw seems to have joined Lano, Loop, and Victor Ray. Wiley and Dizzy are still out on their own, and they have been joined by Mr. Branch and Benito Medici in Mexico. 100 Bullets, Issue 76, Punchline, Part 1 of 4. This story arc is going to be jumping heavily between the different Minutemen factions. We begin in Mexico. Mr. Branch and Benito Medici are watching a cockfight. They are debating who they should bet on. Benito comments, eh, the black one looks good, but the red one seems tough too. Branch replies, yeah, he's feisty, so you taking red? Benito asks, which one you like? Branch answers, whichever one you don't. Benito goes with red. Branch, he says, okay, now we discuss the odds. Meanwhile, back in America, Lano and his crew are relaxing at a shitty motel. They've picked up some girls, or perhaps prostitutes, and they're having themselves a good time. Loop, he's making love to a girl, but then Lano bursts into the motel room and tells him, Hey, little Hughes, you want your turn with the blonde coos? Loop says, nah, I'm good with what I got. Lano tells him, yeah, well, get off her, because I ain't broke my piece off yet. Go park your junk in Blondie. I want a taste of this. So Loop heads outside the motel room. Out there in the pool at the motel, we see Victor Ray sitting poolside, two girls making out, and Jack Daw, naked, passed out on a floating device. We now jump over to Texas, to the third Minuteman faction, headed up by Graves. We see Cole Burns and Remy Rome. Remy, he walks outside and says hello to Cole. Cole asks him, Remy, is the job done? Remy replies, why are you asking? Are you too soft to snuff out old Lady Simone yourself? Cole just shoots back an annoyed look. Remy replies, Nah, not yet. Cole asks, Well then what the hell are you doing down here? All of a sudden, Mia Simone falls from the building and lands on the car beside them, smashing through the roof and dying. Remy now tells Cole, Job's done. I think the word you're looking for is bravo. Alright, another member of the Trust is dead. Mia Simone knocked off here in issue 76. Back down to Mexico to the cockfight. While Branch and Benito Medici are enjoying the roosters pecking at each other, Wiley and Dizzy are outside and they're talking. Dizzy still feels bad about killing Shepard. Wiley assures her, Shepard's death wasn't your fault. Dizzy argues, I shot him, the last man on earth I would think of hurting. I killed him. He was like a father to me. Wiley jokes, in a kinky kind of way? Dizzy frowns, saying, he never touched me. Not his kinkiness I was referring to. Wiley then tells Dizzy about the girl that he killed in his past, Rose Madrid. He killed her for the trust and the Minutemen. He says, when I killed someone I loved, I had a choice. I could have said no. You didn't have that option. Dizzy to this says, that's why I think about killing. Wiley tells her, Come on, Dizzy. If Shep was alive, he would forgive you. Dizzy continues and says, It's not Joseph I think about killing. It's Graves. Back on over to Lano's crew, partying in the motel. 
Loop, he's on the second floor overlooking the pool. And he thinks it's going to be funny if maybe he jumps off of here and lands on Jack that's on the floating device in the pool below. Victor, seeing what Loop is thinking, tells him, I think twice about what you clearly haven't given any thought to. Loop to this says, Why? I can do it. Come on, Vic. It'll be funny. Freak his ass out. Loop, he then dives off the second floor and he lands on Jack. But Jack's cat-like reflexes spring into action. And he flips around and he manages to grab Loop as Loop was landing on him. And he forces Loop under the water of the pool and he holds him below it. Back on over to Graves' crew. Cole and Remy Rome go to talk with Graves. Graves was waiting for them in an abandoned parking garage. Cole tells Graves, Mia Simone is dead. One more house of the trust lost its head. Remy asks, so who's next? Graves responds, quite possibly Remy, one of us. I believe with Simone's death, there will be repercussions coming our way. We have friends who work for our enemies now. Graves is referring to Lano and his crew. Remy to this says, That big dick Hawaiian can suck my ass. Graves continues, But more important, we have friends who right now don't work for anyone. And those are friends we need. Graves is referring to Wiley and Dizzy. Back down to Mexico, Branch and Benito leave the cockfight. The bird that Benito bet on, of course, won, as Benito always seems to win his bets. Branch and Benito rejoin Dizzy. Meanwhile, Wiley is standing out on his own, and he gets a phone call. The phone call is Graves. Wiley answers and says, Fuck you. Graves replies, Wiley, why you want to say that? Wiley answers, Because I'm in a place you can't touch me or her, okay? Graves to this says, You were always my best. We need you, Wiley. Wiley responds, You don't. They do. But screw them. You need her. You come and get her. The lid is blown off. Sky freaking high. The kind of heat I'm willing to bet you ain't willing to take. Graves asks, You won't give her up? Wiley answers, That's right. Graves responds, That's too bad. And then he hangs up. While Graves was having this conversation, I can't help but notice he was enjoying himself a big slice of pie. <laughs> Which I gotta believe is some sort of callback way back to issue 11, the heartbreak sunny side up issue, where Graves was scarfing down a pie as he was telling this woman all about her daughter being a child prostitute. Back on over to Lano's crew. Wiley, worried that Graves was coming for him, decided to bring in a wild card. He phoned Victor Ray over on Lano's side, and he told Victor what was going down. Once the phone call was over, Victor told Lano, Yo Lano, I just got a call from Wiley. He's sitting on the skank that killed Mr. Shepard. Lano then shoots back Victor a determined, pissed off look. 100 Bullets Issue 77, Punchline Part 2 of 4. Lano and his crew are on their way to Mexico. Before they cross the border, though, they stop off to get gas. While at the gas station, Lano phones Augustus Medici. Although instead of Augustus, Megan picks up as Augustus was in the shower and she was over at his place. Lano, hearing Megan, says, All right, Megan, put the bus on. Megan tells Lano, It's Miss Dietrich, and I am the boss of you. Lano responds, That's tough luck. My bosses seem to be dropping out of buildings like flies. Lano then eventually tells Megan that Maya Simone is dead, courtesy of Graves. Lano then continues and says, And while three families lost their heads, hers is the only one Graves is responsible for on my watch. If I look for him, I won't find him, so I'm taking a detour. Megan asks, where is he going? Lano answers, Sunny Mexico. We know that Graves won't go there. Eventually, their phone call ends, and Megan rejoins Augustus and tells him the news. Over to Graves' faction. They are eating at a taco place, and they are discussing their plans. Cole asks Graves, what is the plan? Graves tells him, the plan is for Wiley to bring me what's mine. Cole asks, you want Dizzy? Say the word, and me and Remy will deliver. Graves answers, I want Wiley, too. Cole tells Graves, done. 
But Graves gives some stipulations. He says, no, it has to be Wiley's decision. Graves, he wants to bring Wiley over to his side. Cole is a little bit annoyed by this. He shoots Graves a frustrated look. Graves tells Cole, look, Cole, you're my right hand. Cole says, Wiley's your wrong one. Graves corrects him, saying, Wiley's a leader. Cole asks, what am I? Graves answers, always my right hand. I don't need you to lead. I need to count on you. We jump back over to Lano's crew. They are back on the road again on the way to Mexico. While they're in the car, Lano asks Victor, So Vic, what did Wiley say beyond he's sitting on this girl that killed Shepard? Vic answers that she's dangerous and she's a loose cannon. Lano asks, who's Wiley got with him? Vic, confused, says, what do you mean? Lano says, you know, backup wise, I got you guys, who's he got? Vic answers, her, and she killed Shepard. Loop in the car is frustrated. He's never even met this Shepard guy. He asks, yo, who is this Shepard guy anyway? Vic answers, Shep, he was a frickin' rock. Lano, he answers, if there was any man I'd make blood certain whoever killed him suffers, it's Shep. Back on down to Mexico to Wiley's faction. Dizzy is taking a shower outside while Wiley and Branch look on. Wiley and Branch, they get to talking. Wiley, he then breaks the news to Branch and tells him, I called Graves last night. Branch, surprised, says, you what? He's got the means to find us. Wiley answers, I know. I think I kind of fucked up. Branch says, shit, yeah, I think so. Wiley continues and says, yeah, sorry. Branch, he asks, you want this little Mexican vacation to come to a head, don't you? Wiley answers, I kinda need it to. I like you, Branch. You're a fat little guy who shouldn't be able to save his own life, but... Branch cuts in and says, I've lived through meeting three minute men. Wiley tells him, well, the fourth one will kill you. Branch asks, are you sure? Wiley answers, it's just the odds, bud. But you're a gambler, right? Branch answers, yeah, I'm dead. Wiley tells him, well, not yet. Let's go take a walk. Wiley and Branch then go out for a walk far into the desert. Along the way, Wiley was informing Branch on some sort of plan of his. Finally, when they get to some sort of meeting place, Wiley asks Branch, we got us a deal? Branch, he just shoots back a question asking, Benito, how's he fit in? Wiley answers, bait. Branch says he's got to give it some thought. Wiley tells him, you do that. On your way back to the house, we got company. So Branch, he starts running back to the house where Dizzy and Benito are. And Wiley, he waits. He waits and eventually a car pulls up. Inside the car was Mick Kuchenko, aka the smuggler known as Coochie. Coochie was the one that situated Wiley and Dizzy out here in the desert. Wiley asks, Coochie, what's up? Coochie answers, your time, my friend. I apologize. Yeah, Graves called me. He wants me to do something. Wiley tells Coochie, actually, he wants me to do something. Coochie asks, and you'd rather not? Wiley answers, yeah. Wiley asks Coochie, what if I paid you more than Graves? Coochie says, this one's not for sale. I'd like if it were. Wiley to this says, well, that's okay. I'm not sure I can meet your price anyway. Coochie and his men start preparing their guns, readying to fight Wiley and the others. Coochie asks, so is that it? That's all your negotiation? <laughs> Different time, Mr. Times. You know, Shepard, he knew finesse. He would not have let this happen. Shep was a good man. Wiley, the point man, is preparing to perhaps use his guns. We see them poking out beneath his suit. Wiley asks, so... No go, huh? Coochie answers, no. So Coochie was hired by Graves to come out here and bring back Wiley and Dizzy. Although if Wiley wasn't going to be accommodating, Coochie was under orders to take Wiley down. Wiley was trying to maybe talk Coochie into letting him go, but their talking did not work, so it is now time for some action. Back over at the house in the desert where Dizzy, Benito, and Branch are staying at. The three of them all of a sudden hear tons of gunfire going off. Bam, 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 bam. 
Dizzy, Benito, and Branch, they run up the hill towards the gunfire. And when they arrive, they expect to perhaps see Wiley dead, but no. Wiley, the point man, the man that never misses his shots, managed to take down Coochie and his entire crew. Wiley, he then grabs his cell phone and phones up Graves. Once he gets Graves on the line, Wiley says, Graves? Graves responds, Hello, Wiley. Is Coochie dead? Wiley answers, He is. Who's next? 100 Bullets Issue 78, Punchline, Part 3 of 4. In the Mexican desert, Branch, Benito, and Dizzy are digging a hole to put all of the people that Wiley killed inside of. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Mexico, Lano and his crew pull up to a hotel. There are four of them, but they only ask for three rooms, as they're going to have to take shifts and one person is going to have to stay in the lobby at all times and make sure they don't get any visitors. Victor, he is going to be the first one on watch. Back over to Wiley's crew. Dizzy and the others have finished burying the bodies. Dizzy, she then goes over to talk with Wiley and share a beer with him. Wiley asks Dizzy, Your dead husband and baby, do you miss him? Dizzy answers, Not as much as I used to. I still think about him, but other things I think about more, you know? Wiley to this says, That's good. You need to move on, otherwise it's frickin' crippling. Dizzy explains, Graves giving me opportunity to put down their killers. That helped. While this conversation is going on, back over at Lano's crew in the hotel, Jack, he went downstairs to relieve Victor of his watch duty, when all of a sudden he realized Victor was gone. Jack, he then ran upstairs to tell Lano the news. Back over to Wiley and Dizzy. Wiley asks Dizzy, So, despite the fact that Graves planted a trigger in you so you'd shoot Shepard, you still have a soft spot for the old man? Dizzy answers, No, I want to kill him. Wiley asks, Because he made you a killer? Dizzy answers, No, because he made me do something I wouldn't have done. Wiley tells Dizzy, Graves, he made you, Diz. Think about that. He made you from Jump Street. Dizzy questions, What are you getting at? Wiley answers, The end, baby. Wiley then kisses Dizzy. While he's kissing Dizzy, the comic shifts and Dizzy all of a sudden looks like Wiley's past love, Rose Madrid. We are meant to see some parallels here between Wiley's relationship with Dizzy and that of his previous girlfriend, Rose. Dizzy, she lets the kiss happen. Once they are done, Wiley says, Thanks. Dizzy asks Wiley, I don't know what you did that for. Wiley answers her, For me. Just for me. All of a sudden, Wiley hears a car approaching them there in the desert. He gets nervous. He tells Dizzy, Shit, you strapped? Dizzy says, uh, They're out by the car. Wiley yells at her, Well, get one. Get two. Shit. Dizzy, come on, girl. We got us a shitstorm coming. Wiley, he's pointing two guns at the car that is approaching him. When all of a sudden, the car stops and a friendly face comes out. It is Victor Ray. Having abandoned Lano's crew is now here. Victor tells Wiley, Hey bud, I thought you could use a friend. 100 Bullets Issue 79, Punchline Part 4 of 4 In their little cabin there in Mexico, Wiley, Victor, Branch, Benito, and Dizzy are all talking. Victor tells them all what he's been up to ever since he's been riding with Lano's crew since Chicago. Victor, he then asks Wiley, What I don't get is why Shepard would have chose Lano as his replacement. It just don't make no sense. Wiley replies, Sure it does. Frickin' Hawaiian guy had no alliances, which on second thought means you're right. It don't make any sense. Victor also tells of something that Lano made him do. He says, You had me shoot Megan Dietrich. A sweet easy kill, but he told me to miss her just enough that it wouldn't end her life. Wiley thinks that Lana was being strategic, he says that's a goddamn player move. Graves, he will get blamed for the attempted hit, solidifying Lana's position. So the trust has no idea you are behind that? 
Victor, looking at Benito, says, well, they do now. Benito, he seems pissed. Victor tells him, <laughs> take your best shot, kid. Victor then asks Wiley, so what's our move? Wiley says he's got to do this next part alone. He's going to go across the border and speak with the old man. Dizzy offers to go with Wiley, but Wiley turns her down. Wiley then starts walking to head over to his car and get out of here. As he's leaving, Branch runs after him. Wiley tells Branch, Remember our plan, Branch. Branch nervous says, Yeah, but with Victor here, it kind of changes things. Wiley tells him, Just keep Victor happy. Branch asks how. Wiley answers, Get him a beer once in a while when he asks for one. Branch then comments, You got it all figured out, don't you? Wiley answers, I think I do. See you down the road, fat man. Branch, he then goes back inside the cabin with Dizzy, Benito, and Victor Ray. They all talk a bit more. Victor is making everyone a little uneasy. Victor says he's here to do a job, just like Wiley. Benito responds, yeah, and he left you here to make sure we stay alive. Victor to this says that he did, but I'm truly sorry to say I ain't here to do Wiley no favors neither. Any of you smoke? Branch says that uh, him and Benito do. Victor tells them, well then, you should all have one. Branch asks why. Victor, he just then shoots back a stern look. This makes Branch nervous. He thinks that Victor is trying to send him a message like, they're all going to die soon. But Victor cuts the tension and says, I'm just trying to be nice. Senor Branch, how about a beer? Branch, he goes over to the cooler to grab Victor a beer. While he's fumbling around for the beer, Victor asks Dizzy, So girl, you're the one that did Shepard in. Dizzy doesn't answer. Victor, he continues, I asked you a question. Benito tells Victor, she heard you. Victor, he continues, really? I kind of reckon she was the deaf monkey, seeing as I already got the dumb and the blind pegged. Mr. Branch, still fumbling around for that beer, decides that he needs to step up and do something before Victor takes them all down. Branch, he grabs a gun, and he points it at Victor. We leave the cabin now and go back over to Wiley. Wiley has driven across the border, and he goes to meet with Agent Graves, Cole Burns, and Remy Rome. Graves, he stays back in the car for a bit, so Cole and Remy go to talk with Wiley by themselves. Cole and Remy say hi to Wiley. Eventually, Cole asks, where's the girl? Wiley answers, other side of the border, Cole. Where's Graves? Cole answers, beside himself when he learns you didn't bring her. When you called, you let him to believe that's what you were doing. Wiley to this says, seems I only let him so far. You know, I wanted the chance to talk to the two of you alone, without Graves around. Wiley tells them, you know, I got a goddamn suspicion the Minutemen are involved in some shit we didn't sign on for. Wiley thinks in a way they're still working for the Trust. Cole and Remy don't think that's possible. After all, they're killing members of the Trust. Remy killed Maya Simone recently. Wiley, he thinks Graves is up to something. Cole tells Wiley, Graves don't lie. Wiley to this says, no, he don't, but he might have bought into one. An old lie. I think he's done something he regrets. I know that's where the girl comes in. Cole pulls out a cigarette and comments, Wiley, I get the distinct impression you're talking about yourself. Wiley replies, takes one to no one, Cole. Cole says, I don't know what you're talking about. Wiley responds, I wasn't talking about you. Wiley then begins to reach into the pocket of his suit. He's going to grab some matches to help Cole light his cigarette. But as he's reaching in his suit pocket, Remy mistakes Wiley and thinks he is reaching for a gun instead. So, Remy, he draws his gun and shoots Wiley down. All it took was that one shot. Wiley, he falls down to the ground. And as he's lying there, he sees his old girlfriend, Rose Madrid. Rose tells him, Easy, baby. I got you. Wiley responds to her, Rose, I missed you. Wiley then, losing strength, dies. Agent Graves, he ran over from the car when he heard the gunfire. He runs over to Cole and Remy, and when he sees Wiley dead on the ground, Graves shakes his head in disappointment. This is not what he wanted to happen here. 
back down south in Mexico at the cabin where Dizzy Benito Branch and Victor Ray were staying. Well, Lano and his crew of Loop and Jack arrive at the cabin, and there they find Benito knocked out unconscious on the floor, and nobody else. Victor Ray left Benito for his comrades, and then in a car, he beat up Dizzy, tied her up in the back seat, and he has Branch in the passenger seat. Branch appears to be missing his thumb now. 100 Bullets Issue 80 A Split Decision Victor Ray has transitioned over to Graves' side, and he has brought Dizzy and Branch with him. They are all in an abandoned factory. Victor, he is talking to Branch. He tells him, All right, let's have a look see at your hand here. Oh, bad news. You're gonna live. Branch asks, How long? Victor says, That depends. I got some questions. Branch asks, Does my life depend on them? Victor answers, Nah, not your life. Victor, he then leaves and goes to talk with Cole Burns and Remy Rome. Cole asks if he got the girl. Victor says, gift wrapped. Where's Graves? Cole answers, he's in the car. He ain't happy. Victor questions, oh yeah? Did Wiley decide to go back to Mexico? Cole, knowing the fate of Wiley, answers, maybe. Maybe that's what he was gonna do. Remy, who was the one that killed Wiley, cuts in and says, Hey, he was pulling a frickin' gun on you! Victor soon realizes that Remy killed Wiley. Remy, he argues, I saved your life, Cole, you asshole! Victor, not happy to learn that Wiley's dead, asks Cole, Is that so? Cole, he just answers simply, Maybe. Graves, he then walks into the room and says, Victor, tell me tonight was not a complete frickin' waste. We jump on over to Lano's crew. Loop is driving, Lano's in the passenger seat, Jack Daw is in the back, and Benito is with them as well. On the side of the road, Lano spots an adult bookstore slash movie place. He tells Loop to pull over. Lano wants to rent a booth for the four of them here. The guy behind the counter says, it's one patron per booth. Lano gives the guy a hundred bucks, which is way more than it costs to go into the booth. The guy, he takes the money and tells them to enjoy themselves. All four of them pile into a really small booth room where they watch a video on the screen. Lano, he sits Benito down, and then he positions himself behind Benito. He's holding his shoulders and face. Lano asks Benito, you comfortable? Benito answers, am I supposed to be? Lano replies, hmm, no. Why are you alive? You and me, Benito, we are so connected, it's scary. Your old man, Augustus, he's gonna bite it, probably at Graves' hand, and Graves at mine, which maybe leaves us, you and me, boss. So, with that knowledge dropped hard on your head, do us both a favor and disregard Wiley, who should have smoked your ass, and Victor, who I will roll myself. Let me ask you again, why are you alive? While this questioning is going on, we jump back over to Graves' crew. Graves, Remy, Victor, and Cole all go over to talk with Dizzy. Dizzy is tied up, courtesy of Victor. Cole unbounds her arms and frees Dizzy. Dizzy, looking at Graves, says, I'm gonna kill you. Graves responds, No, you're not. You're going to listen to me. Graves then turns to the others in the room and tells them, Thank you. Now wait outside. While Graves is talking to Dizzy, Cole, Remy, and Victor are in the other room and they're discussing the death of Wiley. Victor, not happy, says, If Wiley really drew on you, you'd both be dead. Remy, he starts reaching for his gun. But Cole tells him, Remy, hang back. I've had it up to here with you tonight. Graves in the other room talking to Dizzy tells her, Wiley's dead. Not by my hand or wishes. Dizzy comments, not like Shepard, huh? Graves smiles when he hears this and says, Hey, that wasn't by my hand, either. <laughs> Dizzy, she tells Graves, I promise I will kill you. Graves to this says, You're right, you will, because I've made sure you would do just that. Shepard certainly understood this. Wiley perhaps came to realize it. You may have thought it was your life that we were trying to protect. It wasn't. It was mine. 
That's why they both die trying to keep us apart. Checks and balances, Dizzy. It's the rules of the game. I trust you understand. After a few more minutes, once Graves finishes up his conversation with Dizzy, he returns to the other room with Cole, Remy, and Victor. Graves brings Dizzy with him and he tells the others, Gentlemen, may I introduce our newest Minuteman, Isabel Cordova. She and I will be heading to New York for a few days. Victor, you take Remy and go make a mess in Tahoe. Remy asks, sounds good, what about Cole? Graves answers, Cole? Cole's got his own mess to clean up. Afterwards, Cole goes to talk to Mr. Branch and says to him, Hey, Stump, you should have gone to Italy when I gave you the chance. All right, so that is the end of issue 80. Before we head into the next story arc, let's see how the landscape of 100 Bullets has changed. We see Victor Ray has now moved over to Graves' side away from Lano, and Dizzy has joined Graves' side as well. Wily Times is now dead, signified by the red X through him. At the end of this story arc, Lano, Loop, and Jack are still with Benito. Graves and Dizzy are headed to New York. Remy and Victor are headed to Lake Tahoe. And Cole and Branch are going to head off on their own business. 100 Bullets, Issue 81 to 83, Tarantula. This story arc encompasses two separate stories. Rather than bounce back and forth between them like the comic does, I'm going to go through them one at a time. So the first story arc involves Ronnie Rome, the brother of Remy Rome. Previously in issue 74, Awake Part 5, Graves tasked Ronnie with going to Italy to retrieve the La Morte del Césaire painting from Echo Memoria. I'm going to do a real Cliff Notes version of Ronnie's story because it is not my favorite. So Ronnie, he shows up in Italy. He meets Echo Memoria. He wants to buy the painting off of her. The whole time, Echo is flirting very heavily to Ronnie. They go to dinner. Then after dinner, Echo is taking Ronnie back to her hotel room to sell him the painting. The one problem is, though, her hotel room is on the third floor of this old hotel, and there is no elevator. Ronnie currently walks with a limp and a cane because he got shot way back in issue 74 in his leg. Echo asks if this is going to be a problem for Ronnie to make it up these stairs. Ronnie tells her no, but it's just going to take him some time. So Echo goes on without him. While Ronnie is making his way up these stairs of this old hotel, he runs into a man named Claudio. Claudio runs up ahead in front of Ronnie, and he goes to the room where Echo was supposed to be in. Only when he barges into the room, Echo is gone. When Ronnie finally arrives in the room, he notices that Echo is gone and only this Claudio is there. And it seems like Echo took off with Ronnie's money. Through a whole convoluted series of events, it seems like Echo was trying to sell the painting both to Claudio and Ronnie. Claudio wanted the painting because he was going to then sell it on to some Japanese businessmen. Ronnie wanted the painting because Graves tasked him with getting it. And Echo, she was just trying to sell the painting multiple times to multiple people to maximize her profit. Ronnie and Claudio, they start conspiring to get the painting. Claudio says he'll sell it to Ronnie instead of the Japanese businessman if Ronnie just pays him about 10% more. Ronnie goes back to his hotel and he finds Echo naked in his bed. It turns out Echo stole his money, but the painting was stolen from her. And Echo claims she only took the money to count it, to save them time later when they would exchange the painting for the money. Eventually, the two of them get to some lovemaking, so Ronnie seems to forgive Echo. Ronnie meets back up with Claudio, who stole the painting from Echo, and Claudio is finally going to sell it to Ronnie, instead of selling it to the Japanese businessman as he was originally going to do. Only the Japanese businessmen find out, and then they attack both Ronnie and Claudio. But then, it seems like the Japanese businessmen were actually secretly working with Claudio, and this was part of some sort of ruse. Eventually, they all start fighting, and they pull out their guns. Ronnie and Claudio manage to lose the Japanese businessman. And then, Ronnie and Claudio are square enough, but then Echo arrives in a taxi cab. Echo is wearing nothing except Ronnie's coat. I don't know why she couldn't throw on any other clothes, but it seems like Brian Azzarello always wants Echo to be nearly naked in this book. 
Echo shoots at Claudio, and then eventually, Echo and Ronnie take off in the cab together with the painting. The two of them start making out in the back of the cab, celebrating their victory, but then Ronnie figures out that Echo must have been lying to him and working with Claudio from the beginning. He says, How did Claudia know where I was supposed to meet you, Echo? Anyway, at the end of their story arc, Ronnie is going to leave Italy with the painting, and Echo is going to stay behind. Alright, now that was Ronnie's story. Now let's jump on to the second story within this story arc. We see Dizzy and Graves are in New York. They are at a jazz club and they are talking about Shepard. They discuss how he was a good man and how they were both very fond of him. Graves, he shares with Dizzy how Shepard was a great basketball player. He then tells the story of how he first met Mr. Shepard way back in the day. We see a young Shepard in New York City. He's playing street basketball and he seems to be the only white guy on the court. Shepard recently got discharged from the army and he left Vietnam. Recently, there was some sort of incident that happened. Shepard had a friend named Tim. Tim may or may not have been gay. And another man named Charlie Owens beat the shit out of Tim because of this. So, Shepard and his boys here, they ended up killing this Charlie Owens. And they are trying to get away with this murder. And this is where Graves comes into the story. A young Agent Graves with a then young Curtis Hughes arrive at the basketball court. And they question people around. Graves and Curtis are trying to get to the bottom of who killed Charlie Owens. And they do suspect Shepard. Or if not him, at least someone here in this basketball game. Shepard is talking to his friends, and they are eyeing Graves and Curtis, watching them. They suspect that Graves is a cop. One of the men tells Shepard they must be sniffing around on account of Charlie's murder. Buy us some time, Shepard, to walk away. Shepard, being the only white one here, seems like the safest choice to talk to these potential cops. Shepard, he goes over to Graves. He asks him, something I can do for you fellas? Graves asks, Charlie Owens is dead. Shepard to this says, yeah, got his head smashed in. I read it in the papers. Graves asks, what I want to know is how and why. Shepard answers, you got me. Later on, time goes by and Graves and Curtis seem more and more convinced that Shepard was the one responsible for killing this Charlie Owens. Curtis, he goes to confront Shepard again later waiting for him by his home. Shepard tells Curtis, Sir, I got no answers for you. None. Curtis told Shepard, I ain't no cop, but we know it was you that killed Charlie Owens. Shepard, he just smiles and tells him, Prove it. The next day at the basketball court, Shepard is talking to his friends again. They ask, What was that conversation the day before? Shepard says, Yeah, they were asking about Charlie's murder. Be cool, though. None of your names came up. Shepard, he continued living his life, and Graves and Curtis were continuing their investigations. One day, Graves and Curtis were tailing Shepard. They were talking about how Shepard was most likely the one that killed Charlie Owens. Graves tells Curtis, No, we, we don't know for sure. We think we know. And it's killing me, that son of a bitch. This guy is really smart. Really smart. Graves then gave Curtis an order. He told him, I need you to do what it is you do. Play heavy at it. Get me something. As soon as their conversation ended, Shepard, who was hiding in the shadows, yells out to their car, Hey, I'm over here. Curtis and Graves go walk over and talk to Shepard. Shepard asks, You watching me? Graves told him, 24-7. Shepard, he just left confidently, humming a tune. Later on, we see Shepard visiting some sort of hospital. He is going to see his friend, Tim, that was beat up by this Charlie Owens. This Tim seems to be in a coma. Shepard, he eventually leaves the hospital and he returns home. When he returns home, he finds Graves and Curtis searching his place. Shepard asks them, what the hell are you guys doing here? Curtis answers, looking for a murder weapon. Shepard messing with them says, try the kitchen. Yeah, and the stove. Put the gas on first. 
Courtesy then grabs Shepard and starts getting rough with him. He holds him down, holding his head to the table. Curtis then tells Graves, I told you, Graves, his friends don't know shit that can connect him to Charlie Owen's corpse. Seems they don't know a lot about our boy here, tight-lipped, when he wants to be. Graves jumps in and says, I think you mean when he has to be. Am I right, Sergeant Shepard? Now, supposedly, although it's not stated directly, we are supposed to learn from this conversation that Shepard is actually gay, and he was potentially discharged from the army for being gay. You could totally read through this next conversation and not pick up that Shepard was gay, but there are little clues. Graves asks Shepard, So you were discharged. In your own words, why were you discharged? Shepard answers, I was a bad soldier. Graves continues, nice. Still protecting the men under you and those above? I admire that. It's a quality I can use. Supposedly, Graves saying men under you and those above is code for Shepard being gay. Either way, Graves, he respects Shepard's ability to get away with stuff, to keep quiet, to outmaneuver people, and to defend those that needed defending. It was then that Graves wanted to hire Shepard to become a Minuteman. Curtis in the room was pissed off, though. That was supposed to be his job, and he kept getting passed over because he was black, and now he's being passed over for this gay guy, Shepard? That doesn't fly with Curtis. Curtis tells Graves, This is bullshit, Graves. This should be my frickin' job. You ain't got a better man in the field than me. Graves replied to Curtis, no I don't, but... Curtis cuts in and says, that's all I'm good for, eh? Field work, ain't it, boss? Graves tells Curtis, I don't make the rules, Curtis. Curtis responds, since when? You're lucky, Shepard. You can hide what you are that scares him. Once again, code for Shepard being gay. Curtis continues, I'll leave you two alone. Shepard, sitting there, asks Graves, Huh, so I uh, take it from that little scene I'm being recruited for something? Graves answers, yes. Shepard says he's listening. Graves continues, First, Charlie Owens. The coroner estimates over 70 blows to his head. Figures his skull was fractured, then collapsed, then was pulverized against the pavement. Why do you do it? Shepard, still admitting to nothing, says, Did I? Graves replies, the NYPD believes it was you. Shepard answers, do they? Graves continues, as do I, but there's no proof. No why, no how. Shepard, still being really cool, says, no kidding. All I will say is, Charlie, he got to better than he gave, in my opinion. Now, about this job offer, I need a new suit. So, that was the story of when Graves met Shepard and recruited him for the Minutemen. Back in the current day, again, Graves and Dizzy left the jazz bar they were in, and they go to the same basketball court, the one that Graves first met Shepard on. Graves tells Dizzy what happened next once he recruited Shepard. He says, Curtis, he continued working for me off and on and then off for good. Training men for a job he was more than qualified for became too bitter a pill. Something I regret. Dizzy retorts, that's hard to believe. Graves asks why. Dizzy answers, I don't think you regret a thing. I think when shit happens, you blame it on those it happened to. Graves to this says, really? What about these attaches? Why do I give people the opportunity to write the shit that happens to them? Dizzy answers, guilt ain't the same as regret, Agent Graves. Graves, he thinks on it and says, Shepard, he, uh, Dizzy answers, taught me a lot. Graves, he then pulls out an attache. He has Shepard's ashes inside, and he releases them into the basketball court, and he says, To our friend here, Joseph Shepard, may he rest in peace in the place that gave him the most. Dizzy watching Graves says, This is fucked. Graves answers, No, it isn't. Come on. The two of them leave the basketball court. Dizzy asks, So Shep, did he ever tell you how he killed that Charlie guy? Graves to this says, Nope, never. 
He got away with murder without my help. I still don't know how. And the two of them then walk on. This ending, 100 Bullets, Volume 11. All right, so here are my thoughts on Volume 11. First, we had the Punchline story arc, and uh, I thought it was pretty entertaining, a lot of it. Having the different factions of the Minutemen, Lano, Graves, and Wily's crew, and uh, them having this epic confrontation. And uh, Remy ends up killing Wily in the end because he thought that Wily was going to draw his gun. Now, of course, maybe Remy had some ulterior motivations beyond that. We shall see in the future. But uh, yeah, really sad to see Wily die. He was one of my favorite characters in this book. I thought he was uh, kind of funny. And um, I liked seeing at least a little bit of a uh, romantic relationship there between Wily and Dizzy at the end there before Wily ended up getting killed off. Um, Graves, he finally gets uh, Dizzy and brings her under his wing. So that'll be interesting to see play out in the future story arcs. One thing uh, I will say as a little bit of a criticism is that we are in volume 11 here, and uh, I wish the book was a little bit more clear on people's motivations. What does Graves want? What does Lano want? What does the Trust want? I want to know. I don't really know. It's a little unclear and uh, foggy what exactly everyone is trying to accomplish here. Why don't Graves and Lano work together? So it's, it's hard to tell, and I wish it was a little bit more clear at this point in the story. Either way, though, it's still a fun ride watching it all go down. Um, the next story arc, the Tarantula one, uh, I thought seeing the origin of Mr. Shepard was kind of intriguing. Um, I thought the stuff about Shepard being gay was so subtle. It could be a little bit more clearly stated, I think. But uh, either way, it was cool seeing Shepard be very stoic. And, you know, he killed this guy, but he is not being intimidated by Graves and Curtis Hughes. So uh, that was cool. And it was fun seeing Graves recruit Shepard and uh, see some of that beginning stuff. Although I will say, kind of unnecessary, the story arc too. It's a little bit filler, but still good to have some of that backstory in here. Then we had the Ronnie Rome going to Italy story arc, which I did not really care for. I thought it was uh, filler as well. This painting is getting to be a little bit much. Who really cares about this painting? Uh, you know, it's just a painting, man. <laughs> um, I guess it was fun seeing Echo being drawn so sexily all the time and uh, never wearing any clothes, it seemed like. <laughs> so if that's something you're into, we're getting a lot of Echo naked in this story arc. But uh, overall, I thought it was a pretty weak story and pretty convoluted as well. And uh, who really cares in the end? So uh, no, I did not like that one. But uh, whatever, Ronnie has the painting now, and uh, we'll see if that um, plays any importance in the future story arcs. So I'm going to give this volume a 7 out of 10. There was some pretty cool things, but there was also some things I did not enjoy. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with volume 12, and then only one more volume left. After that, we end in volume 13.